North Korea in winter is mind-numbingly cold, as cold as my home state of Minnesota. In Pyongyang, I used to wear seven layers of clothing, even to bed. But I was one of the lucky ones. At least I had a few small generator-powered heaters. Most North Koreans don't have any heat at all, or even hats, gloves, or winter boots. But the harsh winters haven't stopped Western travel companies from advertising New Year's trips to Pyongyang. Before the pandemic, tourism was a decent source of income for the regime. And the New Year is a particularly festive time in North Korea. North Koreans don't get that much chance to celebrate. And this time of year, the capital is gussied up with lights and banners and even a few snowmen. It's late December 2015, and a tour group has just landed at Pyongyang. Traveling with a company that advertises trips to destinations your mother would rather you stay away from. And if your mum's anything like mine, North Korea would certainly be on that list. These adventure travelers are Canadian, Australian, British, and American. They wrap up warmly and head out to make the most of their tour with government minders and a strict itinerary of sights to see. First, they're taken to pay their respects at the giant bronze statues of the late leaders, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. The group goes on to sample North Korea's famous beer, produced in a brewery that was shipped part by part from England and reassembled in Pyongyang. They get into an impromptu snowball fight with North Korean children, and then they join throngs of North Koreans for the highlight of the trip, a fireworks display over the Taedong River. And I have to say, fireworks in North Korea are pretty spectacular. They also tour the USS Pueblo, an American spy ship that North Korea attacked and seized in 1968 in international waters off the coast of Korea. One American was killed in that raid, and the North Koreans took the 82 other crewmen captive. After 11 months of interrogations, beatings, and near starvation, the ship's commander signed a forced confession to get his men released. The crew went home, but the North Koreans kept the Pueblo as a propaganda prize. It's now part of the War Museum in Pyongyang. Tourists who board are treated to a classic North Korean propaganda video. The brave seamen of our people's army captured Pueblo, the armed spy ship of the U.S. imperialist, which was conducting espionage in our territorial waters, and over 80 aggressors on board a ship. I've been on board the USS Pueblo, and as an American, let me tell you, it's chilling. Much of the ship has been preserved as it was, from the bullet holes to the books the crew were reading. Boarding the Pueblo always feels like a warning and a reminder that in the minds of the North Koreans, the war with the United States is still very much alive and that there's always an element of risk for any American visiting North Korea. After a few days taking in the sights, it's time for the tour group to fly home. But as they're making their way through immigration at Pyongyang Airport, soldiers pull aside one member of the group, an American university student. One by one, his fellow travellers board the plane, and when it finally closes its doors, it takes off, leaving him behind, alone. This young man is about to be swept up in a geopolitical standoff between North Korea and its enemy number one, the United States of America. From the BBC World Service, this is The Lazarus Heist, season two. I'm Jean Lee. And I'm Jeff White. Episode four, Fire and Fury. my role as a North Korea analyst, I spend a lot of time trying to understand the mind of the man at the helm of the North Korean regime. And I think to understand all the cyber heists we've been telling you about, I think we need to see them in the context of Kim Jong-un's grand plan. The stories we've brought you this season, the jackpotting heist in 2018, the dark web deals with Big Boss and Hush Puppy in 2019. When I look at these stories, I want to trace this international drama back to Pyongyang and to Kim. I want to know why Kim felt he needed to ramp up all this hacking. And I believe we need to go back a few years and look at what was happening in Pyongyang. In 2016, in the days after that spectacular New Year's fireworks display, 
Kim Jong-un initiates a bold game of geopolitical chess, where the goal is to elevate North Korea to nuclear power status. But not all of his moves go according to plan. This is the story of how North Korea ends up more isolated than ever, and even more dependent on the funds stolen by their elite hackers from the Lazarus Group. And the story I want to tell you starts with this American college student in Pyongyang. His name is Otto Warmbier. He's a 21-year-old from Cincinnati, Ohio. After he's arrested in January 2016, at the end of his New Year's trip to North Korea, he's not seen or heard from for three months. Not until he appears at a staged press conference in Pyongyang. Through my tour in this country, I have come to see that reality in the DPR Korea is very different from the state of evils that the West had. And I have come to see that the current human rights issues in the DPR Korea, consistently highlighted by the United States administration, is nothing more than an excuse to harm and eventually overthrow the government of the DPR Korea. It sounds to me like Otto is reading a script written for him by the North Koreans. That use of DPR Korea as a giveaway, it's a term that only the North Koreans use. And in that statement, Otto confesses to a crime and he pleads for mercy. I have made the single worst decision of my life. And I beg that you find it in your hearts to give me forgiveness and allow me to return home to my family. And the crime he's accused of committing trying to steal a poster from the staff quarters of a Yangakdo hotel. Not just any poster, a propaganda poster that includes the name of the late leader Kim Jong-il. In North Korea, vandalizing anything to do with the Kims is considered an anti-state crime, an act of sedition. What might seem like harmless mischief is grounds for arrest in North Korea. And the country's in no rush to release Otto. For them, he's a valuable asset. North Korea's got a long history of detaining Americans at tense times. It's a tactic the regime's critics call hostage diplomacy. Here's how it works. The North Koreans detain an American on flimsy charges to try to lure the U.S. to send a high-level envoy for negotiations. They want to see what they can get out of them. So if the envoy comes, North Korea releases the prisoner, making it look like a humanitarian gesture. It's a game Pyongyang has been playing for decades, ever since seizing the USS Pueblo. Following his confession, Otto is sentenced to 15 years hard labour. That's 15 years for allegedly trying to steal a poster. And then, silence, nothing. He vanishes from public view. His family can't get any news about him. He just disappears. Otto Warmbier's arrest comes on the eve of one of the most turbulent times in North Korea's relationship with the world, a period in which Kim Jong-un proves more provocative than ever. It's the 11th of February 2017, more than a year since Otto's arrest. Fresh from his inauguration, President Donald Trump is at his Florida resort, Mar-a-Lago, where he's hosting the Japanese Prime Minister for a bit of relaxed diplomacy. Two leaders have played some golf, of course, and now they're sitting down to dinner with their wives on the terrace where there's a keyboard player serenading them. Suddenly, aides gather around the table as the two leaders receive some breaking news. North Korea has just test-launched a medium-range ballistic missile, which hurtles eastwards towards Japan before plunging into the sea. This timing is not just a coincidence. President Trump has been in office for just a few weeks, and this is the first North Korean missile test of his presidency. This provocation is designed not just to test the missile, but also to test this new American leader and his Japanese ally. After all, on the campaign trail, Donald Trump didn't exactly hold back when he got onto the topic of North Korea. Take this interview with CBS News. North Korea's nuclear effort is the top threat to the United States. What would you do to deal with that reclusive country? I would get China to make that guy disappear in one form or another very quickly. And let me tell you, people say, How do you say, make oh, him disappear and assassinate him? Let me just tell you, no. Well, you know, I've heard of worse things, frankly. I mean, this guy's a bad dude. You might think these comments would enrage Kim Jong-un. People in North Korea have been executed or assassinated for saying far less. But the North Koreans are expert in using these insults to their advantage. They may even relish them. 
because they can use them to tell their people that North Korea is under threat of attack from the United States. And that tension gives Kim justification to keep pouring money into missiles and nuclear weapons while his people go without adequate food, heat, or electricity. He tells them their sacrifices are for the sake of the nation's survival. Nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles are core to Kim's strategy for leadership. And his weapons program follows two tracks. First, it is about defending North Korea. But second is their value in negotiations with other countries. He wants a big payoff to get rid of some of those weapons. It's nuclear blackmail. And all the while, he's building bigger and better weapons to improve that negotiating position. And after that February 2017 launch, North Korea begins carrying out new tests every single month. Kim Jong-un is playing a long game where he's always trying to be one move ahead. Except somewhere inside a hospital in North Korea, there's a situation developing and it's something even this all-powerful dictator can't control. It's June 2017, and Ambassador Joseph Yoon, he's Trump's special envoy for North Korea, receives an urgent message from North Korean officials. They tell him that Otto Warmbier, the American student detained on his Pyongyang vacation, is seriously unwell. In fact, he's unconscious. By this point, 15 months have passed since Otto was sentenced to 15 years. His plight has fallen from the headlines, but during that time, Ambassador Yun has been trying to keep a back channel open with Pyongyang to negotiate Otto's release. Now, the ambassador needs to scramble a team to fly to North Korea to find out what's happened to Otto and hopefully bring him home. They're going to need a doctor to travel with them to provide urgent medical care. Luckily, they know just the guy. My name is Michael Flickiger. You can call me Mike during this interview. That would be the best. For 15 years, Dr. Mike Flickiger was medical director of Phoenix Air Ambulance, a company that specializes in emergency air rescues. We fly into many places where there are guards on the tarmac with uh, assault rifles, so it's that sort of thing. The crew assemble in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Yoon is joined by Mike, a paramedic, and another diplomat. He briefs the team on the flight. He said, we should expect that everything we say and do will be heard somewhere when you're in your room. So always be aware of that. And then he says, if some beautiful young Korean woman knocks on your door in the middle of the night, don't let her in. <laughs> and it was kind of a joke, but it made the point that uh, there may be some attempts to breach our sort of wariness. The plane lands in Pyongyang. The Americans are greeted on the tarmac by diplomats and armed North Korean soldiers. They're escorted to an opulent riverside guest house on the outskirts of the city, where the negotiations begin. Given something terrible has clearly happened to Otto, you might think the North Koreans would simply release him, that they wouldn't want to risk outraging the Americans even further by demanding something in return. But that's not what happens here. It was tense. They made the request, demand, however you want to say it, of $2 million, which would be a condition of releasing him. We went back up to Joseph Ewan's room and we were sitting there talking. And at some point I made the statement, that's just extortion. And <laughs> Eric Gray, the paramedic, uh, he looked at me, his eyes were big as he pointed to the ceiling and, you know, don't say stuff like that. <laughs> and I'll tell you that, that stayed with me all night because I, I woke up in the middle of the night, oh man, what, what did I do? Are they gonna tap on my shoulder when we get to the airport and say, hey, you're coming back with us? They're right to be cautious. I've stayed at that same guest house. It's where they put up American VIPs. And you should always expect that the North Koreans might be listening in. It all sounds very stressful. This $2 million the North Koreans are asking for they don't call it a ransom, of course. They say it's to cover the cost of Otto's medical treatment, which is pretty audacious given he fell ill while under their care. But the North Koreans have got form for this. They reportedly once invoiced for the cost of the bullets they used to shoot down an American helicopter. Uh, 
On day two, there's still no agreement on Otto's release. But Mike is granted permission to visit him. And it's at the hospital where the reality of the situation really sinks in. And there was Otto Warmbier in his bed, clearly much thinner. He had a buzz cut instead of that full head of hair that he had. He had probably four nurses in the room, and then uh, there were two doctors. Uh, so they said, you may examine Otto. And so I went to the sink to wash my hands, and there was no running water. And what did you think? Well, just uh, like, okay, this is an ICU, and we don't have running water in the sink. So that was a stark reminder of where we are and what's happening. Otto is being kept in one of Pyongyang's best facilities, the Friendship Hospital, where foreigners are treated. But even at the top hospitals, there's usually no water when you turn the tap, and certainly no hot water or heat. I see nurses there working in full-length snowsuits because it's so cold. So Mike has to make do with some sanitizing wipes. And then he begins to examine Otto. We rolled him over. We, you know, we checked all parts of his skin. He was awake. His eyes were open. He does react. You know, if you clapped your hand by his ear, he would startle a little bit. And they said the same thing to us, that he responded to music very well. So oh he did gosh. have a reaction, but it's non-purposeful. It's not, not purposeful. And he couldn't communicate. He wasn't communicating. He could not communicate at all, no. After examining Otto, Mike still can't be sure what caused him to lose consciousness. The North Koreans tell him they think Otto's condition might be down to botulism or an adverse reaction to sleeping pills he'd been given to calm his anxiety. But Mike is sure of one thing. Otto isn't simply in a coma. He's in a state of non-responsive wakefulness, what used to be called a persistent vegetative state. And that's much more serious because you can recover from a coma. Otto has permanent brain damage. He'll never recover. The North Koreans ask Mike to write a medical report. So what I told everybody, I said, I'll, I'll say anything to get him out of there if, if that's what it takes. But I didn't have to lie. So you were prepared to lie? I was prepared to lie, yeah. I was prepared to write a report that would be satisfactory to the North Korean officials, including the doctors. But I didn't have to lie. My impression was that he got good care after whatever catastrophic event happened to him. He got good care in the hospital. I commented on that. The fact that he had no skin breakdown after being bedridden, basically, for that amount of time, uh, speaks to the quality of the care that they gave him. Kind of a, ironically, a level of care you wouldn't get in an American ICU because he just... Well, they've got manpower. They got manpower, exactly right. All that's left is to get Otto home to his family. But the North Koreans don't seem willing to release him without getting something in return. The negotiations are going around and around in circles until... Joseph Yoon told the North Korean negotiators, we're going back on that plane whether you release Otto Warmbier or not. We're not going to sit here and negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. He kind of called their bluff on it and said, we're going back. The tactic works. He knocked on the door and said, let's go. They've agreed to let him go. This is a classic North Korean negotiating strategy. They're very formal. They're unwilling to budge on any point until the other side is at their wit's end, willing to give up empty-handed, and only then do they get serious. In this case, the North Koreans are still asking for that $2 million. Joseph Yuen receives an invoice and he signs it. But as far as we know, that $2 million was never actually paid. The United States has a policy of not paying ransoms, and Ambassador Yoon and President Trump have denied this money was ever sent. We can't know exactly what went on during the negotiations, but with this invoice signed, North Korea agree, finally, to release Otto. The next time Mike sees him is on the tarmac at Pyongyang Airport. Otto is on a stretcher, and he's carefully loaded onto the plane. We talked to Otto a lot. We just talked to him as if he could understand. Otto, you're going home. The plane lands in Cincinnati, Otto's hometown, where his family finally gets to see him for the first time in 18 months. Otto dies in hospital six days later. His parents maintain Otto was tortured in North Korea. They say his hands, legs and teeth were horribly damaged. However, the coroner said they found no obvious evidence of torture or physical abuse. 
On the coroner's report, Otto's manner of death is listed as undetermined. Nobody knows, definitely, so maybe the Koreans do, but the best theory is, in my mind, that because he was so agitated on the day he went into prison, I mean, they had given him a couple of sedatives to calm him down. And so my best guess is that he was over-sedated and stopped breathing. What is clear is that North Korea was responsible for detaining Otto for trying to steal a poster. He'd most likely be alive and thriving if he'd been allowed to fly home with the rest of his tour group. It's such a tragic story. The North Koreans may have thought it would be handy to have an American in custody as a bargaining chip as they embarked on a provocative stretch of missile tests. But if that was the strategy, it went badly wrong. President Trump seizes on Otto's death as an example of North Korean brutality. Otto's death provides him with a powerful emotional argument to call for a swift and severe global response to North Korea's actions. It's a brutal regime, and we'll be able to handle it. The US is about to ramp up the pressure on Kim Jong-un, and this time there are going to be dramatic consequences. Coming up, I meet someone who witnessed this fallout firsthand from inside the North Korean regime high-ranking defector whose life after this 2017 showdown would never be the same again. When I was in Pyongyang during the 2010s, North Korea's propaganda machine was pumping out a ton of content glorifying rockets and missiles. You would see huge replica rockets all over the place. Even in children's playgrounds, you'll see slides shaped like missiles. Images of weapons are everywhere, on TV, on posters, on calendars, even on the notebooks that children use for their homework, all giving credit to Kim Jong-un. The North Koreans I met seem genuinely proud that their tiny country is able to master this technology. That's everyone from school children all the way up to the most senior ranking members of the country's elite. The North Korean government say we are a nuclear state, and so you need to do your diplomacy with confidence. This is Yu hyun He's a former North Korean diplomat and one of the most senior people to have left the North Korean regime. And that makes him a valuable source of information about its inner workings. Today, He's part of the North Korean defector community in South Korea. And last year, when I was in Seoul, I tracked him down. Now, he still has to be careful about revealing where he lives. He's very cautious because his life is possibly at risk even in South Korea. So we meet in a quiet hotel overlooking a forest. Where I make each of us a cappuccino. He hasn't spoken much in public, so I was really keen to meet him. He turned up in a suit, like the diplomat that he was, but smiled and laughed a lot throughout the interview. He struck me as being very thoughtful. So back in 2017, when Kim Jong-un was in the middle of his unprecedented program of missile testing, Mr. Yu was working in the North Korean embassy in Kuwait. Mr. Yu had an important job, helping to promote North Korea's interests abroad. But it's a job that would get increasingly difficult with every weapons test. And that's what I wanted to talk to him about. Because Mr. Yu is one of only a handful of people who can tell us what it was like to work for Kim Jong-un during this tumultuous period. And it would change Mr. Yu's life forever. So Mr. Yu starts out by giving me a bit of his backstory he'd been part of the Kim's inner circle since childhood. My father was one of the bodyguards for Kim Il-sung, and I went to an elementary school where only the children of army officers go. Right, so a dad who's a bodyguard to the Kim family, that's a golden ticket in North Korea, right? Absolutely. Political power is centered on proximity to the Kims, and with that comes opportunity. Mr. Yu was groomed to be a diplomat from a young age, and he was steered toward learning Arabic when he was at school. And eventually, he was sent to work abroad in North Korea's embassy in Syria. It was 2010, and he was in for a culture shock. 
My travel route was from Pyongyang to Beijing, Beijing to Moscow, and finally to Damascus. Beijing was just so cool, and I saw how quickly China was developing. There were high skyscrapers, modern apartments, uh, construction everywhere. It felt like the world was pulsating. But life abroad is still tough for North Korean diplomats. It's not all dinner parties and handshakes. Right. For starters, the regime requires its embassies to be self-sufficient. That has at times forced staff to resort to various illicit schemes to make quick money, to pay rent and salaries. For example, in Pakistan, it's a Muslim country where the sale of alcohol is strictly controlled. North Korean diplomats have been suspected of smuggling whiskey, wine, and tequila. And in India, where cows are regarded as sacred, a North Korean embassy was reportedly selling illegal beef from a makeshift abattoir in its basement. That's absolutely amazing. Knock off beef from the North Koreans. And North Korea's embassies play a vital role in helping the country evade international sanctions by acquiring and moving the materials, machines and missile parts that Kim Jong-un needs for his weapons program. Embassies also provide a fantastic smokescreen for North Korea's illicit deals. Under international law, they're privileged areas. Local authorities can't just walk in and search them. And diplomats sometimes have immunity from prosecution. Mr. Yu soon learns his office in Syria is a hub for a highly lucrative enterprise, selling weapons. And he knows this because he's the one translating all the deals. There were probably around 100 North Koreans dispatched to Syria for the weapons trade. Syria used a lot of North Korean specialists, engineers, technicians, and so on. 70 of them were related to a multiple rocket launcher factory in Syria, built, managed, and operated by North Korea. This is backed up by UN reports as well. North Korea was shipping materials to Syria that could be used to manufacture weapons, and North Korean missile technicians were spotted working in the country. And Syria isn't the only country North Korea was entering into weapons-related ventures with. Mr. Yu reels off a list of business partners. Syria, Syria Egypt, Egypt, Sudan, Sudan Ethiopia, Ethiopia, Hamas, Hamas Angola, Angola, Uganda, Uganda Namibia. Namibia. Of course, the problem with peddling arms is that there's a high chance someone's eventually going to use them. And in spring 2011, as the Arab Spring protests erupt across the region and civil war breaks out in Syria, Mr Yu is quickly moved to safety and a new posting, this time in Kuwait. Staff here oversee North Korea's dealings across the whole Gulf region. They're managing the lives of some 10,000 North Korean workers in Kuwait, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. The majority of them work on construction sites, building skyscrapers. But Mr. Yu is also introduced to a small team engaging in much more specialized work. Mr. Yu says every day, the embassy in Kuwait would get a call from a house in Dubai delivering the same message. All of us are here, present and correct. The caller is a North Korean minder who's watching over a team of hackers. Did you see any of these hackers yourself? Yes, of course I saw them. There were 19 hackers in Dubai. I would go to their house. In each room, there were two or three beds. And I went to the living room, and there was this one big table where everyone had gathered to work on their computers. And I said, you don't have an office? And they said, yeah. This is our office. This is our sleeping space and our office. That's really all they need. A computer that's connected to the internet. Sounds a lot like those hacker dorms in China we heard about in season one, right? Indeed. North Korea denies that they have any hackers posted abroad, of course. But Mr. Yu's description here fits with FBI allegations about how these cyber units operate around the world. Mr. Yu says all of these men had legitimate visas to work in Dubai as IT programmers. And those hackers are doing the same thing as the weapons dealers, 
The construction workers, even the booze bootleggers and the beef salesmen, they're all earning money for the regime, much of which is believed to be ploughed into Kim Jong-un's number one priority, building and testing increasingly powerful weapons. And in 2017, all that testing is about to turn Mr Yu's privileged embassy life upside down. On July 4th, 2017, while Americans are celebrating Independence Day, North Korea spoils the party by testing a long-range intercontinental ballistic missile designed to reach the mainland United States. Kim Jong-un describes the launch as a holiday gift to the Trump administration, timed to hit the arrogant Americans in the nose. This comes barely a month after the death of Otto Warmbier, and America still has North Korea on its mind. President Trump goes on the offensive. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, Kim Jong-un is undeterred by President Trump's threats. And two months later, on September 3rd, 2017, North Korea carries out another test, this time a nuclear test, at its underground Pungeri test site. And this is super serious. The resulting quake indicates that this nuclear device is five or six times stronger than anything North Korea has tested before, and up to 16 times stronger than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. President Trump escalates his war of words. The United States has great strength and patience, but if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. The threat of war at this point is deemed so serious that James Mattis, who was then U.S. Defense Secretary, reportedly slept in his gym clothes and had a flashing light installed in his bathroom to alert him just in case North Korea should launch an attack. This nuclear test and the very real fear of war that follows turns the whole world's attention to the North Korean problem. This time, the outrage in the international community is so strong that even North Korea's longtime allies are having second thoughts about appearing too friendly with the country. Mr. Yu is about to find that out. Over at the North Korean embassy in Kuwait, he's busy with preparations for the annual National Day party. That's when North Koreans celebrate the creation of the state. And it's September 9th, which in 2017 falls just a week after that nuclear test. We celebrate in a five-star hotel in Kuwait, so we had a huge, huge celebration planned for about 250 people. But almost nobody showed up. Typically, China and Russia send somebody, you know. Even if they're upset, they send people, lower-level diplomats, somebody. But they never boycott us entirely. It is just diplomatically rude. It's humiliating. And Mr. Yu isn't just losing face among fellow diplomats. Even when he's out buying groceries in Kuwait, he's begun to notice locals laughing when they spot his loyalty badge featuring the Kim's faces pinned to his chest. The first thing they would say is, they would make the sound of a missile. They would be making fun. And that was really embarrassing. But Mr. Yu has more urgent issues to worry about. In response to the September nuclear test, a host of countries announced plans to expel North Korean diplomats, including Kuwait. In early September of 2017, we got an urgent call from the Kuwait Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And they said, in compliance with the UN sanctions, we would like to reduce the number of North Korean diplomats in Kuwait. And we hope that the North Korean ambassador will leave the country. He was basically saying that he wants the ambassador out. 
and he was just using polite diplomatic language to beat around the bush. And the ambassador asked, what have we done to you? How can you do this to us? The atmosphere was really intense. This is the first time I'm talking about this, but at the time, I felt like something was collapsing inside me. What am I doing here? You know, I've been hearing from our government that our leader is the greatest. We are a nuclear state. And we should have pride about that. But actually, abroad, we were met with discrimination and coldness. I felt so much shame and embarrassment. Within weeks, Kuwait expels the North Korean ambassador and four diplomats. With the embassy down to a skeleton staff, a panicked Mr. Yu steps in as acting ambassador. And he's going to have a tough time in that new job because the international fallout following Kim's latest tests is only just beginning. All the provocative activity of 2017, coupled with the horror of Otto Warmbier's tragic death, has given the US a powerful diplomatic hand to play. In the wake of Otto's death, President Trump empowers his envoys at the UN Security Council to lobby for new sanctions on North Korea, something that could really hammer Kim's economy and put the brakes on his weapons program. This US-led effort results in three rounds of new UN sanctions, the most stringent that North Korea has ever seen. That's right. The sanctions are aimed at punishing North Korea for their defiance and stopping the flow of money into the nuclear program. There's a total ban on some of North Korea's biggest exports, including coal and iron, and they severely restrict the flow of fuel into the country. That's a huge blow to the North Korean economy. Even China, North Korea's main benefactor and ally, signs on to the sanctions. The sanctions also go after another key source of income for the regime, its workers abroad. The UN Security Council instructs member nations not to extend North Korean work visas and gives countries a two-year deadline to send them home. This is a nightmare for North Korea. These overseas workers are an important source of income and, according to Mr. Yu, nestled among them are members of North Korea's elite hacker army who've been working under the guise of legit IT workers. By ordering them home, the UN is hitting Kim's cybercrime program too. Mr. Yu now has his work cut out for him overseeing the repatriation of those 10,000 North Korean workers in the Gulf region who are under his watch, including the 19 hackers in that Dubai dormitory. Pretty soon, he hears stories from colleagues back home about high-ranking officials being punished for the loss of those lucrative contracts. Stripped of their privileged roles, they're sentenced to hard labor, working in North Korea's coal mines. Mr. Yu has already begun to question what he's still doing, working for a regime the world reviles. And now, he's begun to worry he's in danger. It's a pivotal moment for him. Over the course of a stressful week of hushed discussions, he and his wife make a life-changing decision to take their young daughter and escape the North Korean regime. I talked with my wife and our conclusion was defection. And now we think we made the right choice because the more we spend time outside, the more we realize how absurd of a country North Korea is. Defection is never an easy decision for any North Korean. It means leaving your extended family behind for good and knowing they'll likely bear the brunt of any punishment on your behalf. It means breaking from an ideology that has ruled your life and realizing that everything you did on behalf of the state as a good North Korean is viewed very differently outside North Korea. It means leaving a system where you knew how to rise and trading it for freedom in a country, South Korea, where some people see you as the underclass. Mr. Yu, his wife and their daughter started their lives over in Seoul. Like so many North Korean diplomats I got to know over the years, he did his very best for his country, until he simply couldn't. Mr. Yu left at a moment when things were getting very tough for Kim Jong-un's diplomats. At the end of 2017, the US has put North Korea on its list of countries that sponsor terrorism, and those UN sanctions are really biting. 
and even some of the most loyal servants of the regime, people like Mr Yu, have become deeply disillusioned and desperate enough to defect. Plus, those sanctions resulted in a clampdown on overseas workers, right? And that meant all those hackers in Dubai were supposed to be sent home. So surely this was bad news for North Korea's hacking program. But of course, we know the hacking didn't stop. That's right. And that's a big issue with international sanctions. They only work when countries enforce them. And to be honest, investigators aren't 100% sure how many hackers actually made it home after their visas were cancelled. And that's very fortunate for Kim, because after this crunch point in 2017, he's going to really need his hacker army. Think about it. His main trade exports are harshly controlled. It's much trickier to make money by sending workers overseas. He's being forced to shrink his embassies, which massively limits any arms dealing or other business North Korea can do abroad. He's burnt through the goodwill of even his closest allies. So what does he do? Well, he's still got muscle in cyberspace, and he's going to be relying on them now more than ever before. We've already seen that in the stories we've covered so far in this season. The ATM jackpotting raids, the vast sums laundered by Big Boss and Hush. It seems the hackers are really keeping Kim's show on the road. These sanctions did put a major stranglehold on Kim's economic plans. But, as I've said, he's nothing if not strategic. There is a method here, a plan. And his next move comes completely out of left field. Amid all this tension, Kim Jong-un unexpectedly extends an olive branch. North Korea is about to make a grand appearance at the 2018 Winter Olympics, where Kim joins forces with South Korea. Hold on to your hats, because these Olympics are set to be the stage not only for an unprecedented North-South collaboration, but also for a cyber attack that's going to fox even the brightest minds in the hacking world. That's next time on The Lazarus Heist. The Lazarus Heist is an original podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jeff White. And I'm Jean Lee. Our producer is Viv Jones. Our original music was composed by Magnus Fiennes and Ia Wu from the South Korean band Jambanai. And as ever, we'd love to hear your feedback. Please keep leaving us those ratings and reviews and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And spread the word on social media using the hashtag Lazarus Heist. Thank you for listening.